Hello, everybody. Just a quick announcement to say that in two weeks' time, we will have reached the end of the Occult series of the podcast. And I would love to hear from you guys. On that last episode of the series, I'll be reading feedback about what's been your favourite episode and your favourite occult horror movie. So please do send in your feedback. I'd love to know your thoughts on this series. I'd love to know what your favourite occult horror movie is and why, and any other comments you might want to have read out on. On the podcast. You can either write me something in an email or you can even record a little voice memo on your phone and send that in and I will play it on the podcast. So please do send any feedback, whether it's in written or voice form, to evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. That's evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. When the devil walked in on me, he oh, There is evil everywhere. And the sentinel is the only one. Jennifer's evil. I know. No, I mean, she's actually evil. Not high school evil. Do you know what the stigmata are? Five wounds. His back was scourged by whips. Or nails driven through his hands. And feet. Choose to admit your crimes before man and God. God does not spare angels when they sin. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. And if you're listening to this on the day that it's out, happy Friday the 13th. (laughs) My name is Mike. No surname, just Mike. I am the spookily mononymed Mike. And as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of exploring the evolution of the occult in horror cinema, and this is part 20. It's that time again in which we get towards the end of a series and we take a break from in-depth reviews to have a little look at some additional recommendations. Other occult movies that we haven't had time to discuss this series. So none of these discussions will be spoilerific. They will all be spoiler free. It will simply be a list of perhaps slightly lesser known in some cases occult movies that you can hopefully try and check out if you like the sound of. Uh, So we've got absolutely loads to cover this episode as you can imagine so get your pen and papers or your phones or whatever it is you use to write things down at the ready because we are going to be coming at you thick and fast with movie titles and recommendations joining me of course to bring you the also rans list is one of my regular co-hosts on the podcast he's seen every shit horror film under the sun so it's only right to have him here this week welcome back brad hansen thanks mate it's been a while it's been so long how have you been um busy but yeah, good. not dying of coronavirus as yet. As yet. Okay, good to know. Uh, so uh, let me ask you a little bit about your thoughts on the occult movies and the occult in movies. It's a very broad term, but are you a fan of these types of movies? Yeah, um, I do quite like them. I mean, you know, you look at things like The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby and, yeah. you know, more contemporary films like A Dark Song, uh, which I think you're covering next week. We are, our um, last one. Which is uh, quite the one to go out on the bang on, to be fair. Um, I like them. Um, I don't love them. Mm -hmm. They're not my... But the thing is, it's such a broad term because I posted out about, uh, you know, what what should we cover in this Also Rans episode? Yeah, literally anything. uh, Literally, people going, is the Neon Demon a cult? And I'm like, sort of. Do you know what we we actually could have done had I thought about it and had I had time? We could have done an Also Rans for witches and we could have done one for the devil Satan. as a character and we could have done you know like all of those different and one for cults or whatever it might be like yeah, we yeah. did with Hicksploitation because you can 
there are like branches subsets. There. Subsets. Exactly. Particular subsets are in the horror <laughs> genre. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll come one back day. to that. Uh, lovely. So we've got we've got a fair, a, pr- a pretty pretty substantial list. We've got a chunky little list to, to get, get through. through. Some of which we can talk about more than others. Some of which we've had time to rewatch. Some of which we may not have watched in years or never watched. So we'll do as much as we can. The important thing is that we listen to you. Exactly. And exactly. We suggest things and then we both go shit. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen that one, but we'll wing it. Exactly. We'll wing it. We um, we. we we managed to cram in a few for you guys. We have, we have, yeah. So because we do listen, and a lot of people had a lot of. There are there are certain films that people get very excited about. And like, why haven't you covered this? Can you cover this? So we've tried our best to include them all. In the not everyone is going to be happy. <laughs> no, all of the time. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and today is just another example of that <laughs> of time uh, of, of days when we do not make people happy. Bitterly disappointing. Exactly. People, That's but... why we're here. Uh, amazing. So let's we'll, we'll we'll do the usual right and go sort of chronologically. We'll start with our oldest on the list, as is accustomed to us. Yes. Excellent. All right. So what is first on our list? The first one is one that you are taking the lead on. It's from. <laughs> oh, good. Um, it is from 1967. And this is called V. Okay, so V from 1967. This is an interesting film. It's one that a lot of you guys told me to check out. I know that Anna Bogotskaya, friend of the pod, is a big fan of this film as well. Uh, This was a... Obviously, this was a Soviet horror film. uh, And according to what I read online, it is actually the first Soviet-era horror film to be officially released in the USSR. Uh, It was allowed to be released because it was based on a folk tale. Now, this actually does feel more like a folk horror than an occult horror, actually, to be honest. Although, of course, there's so much crossover here uh, in these two subgenres. Um, it is about a witch, but it's also it's it's so much got the vibe of an of an old sort of period set folk tale. It's set in this kind of rural little village, um, and I guess it feels a bit like an update of a movie like Hacksaw from the twenties, um, or it reminded me a little bit of Ingmar Bergman's early work. Something of it that reminded me of The Virgin Spring as well. So it, it's got those kind of vibes. Uh, the story is nice and simple and bonkers. Uh, it's about these three priests who get drunk in the woods and come across a witch. Uh, this kind of old crone witch. This witch causes havoc. She flies this uh, priest around on her. A broomstick this priest does not take kindly to this and he starts beating her to death but then miraculously all of a sudden this old crone witch has turned into this young beautiful witch uh, and it's this young beautiful woman who turns out to be the daughter of one of the richest most powerful men in the village this priest now fears for his life because he has beaten her to death and the rest of the film uh, kind of then explores the consequences of his actions and it's kind of this priest versus this witch essentially uh, there's lots of kind of wacky fun there's lots of hijinks there's lots of very silly special effects and visual effects there's an amazing moment where this woman sort of uh, stands astride on a coffin that flies into the air and kind of zooms around the room there's loads of really funny interesting uh, visual effects it's really fun it zips along Uh, as I say it's got the feeling of more of a a folk horror than an occult horror Uh, but I really really enjoyed it if you're a fan of those types of movies if you like things like Haxan and the kind of old-fashioned charm that movies like that have then i would definitely check out v from 1967 uh you haven't seen this one have you no no i no. told you it was on youtube yeah exactly exactly but we uh we we hedged our bets and spread the cost so this is interesting because obviously mm. this might be the first time we've talked about an also rounds up episode where <laughs> i haven't seen a film we're talking exactly about. well that's it's very rare um this was on shudder a little while ago was it mm. and then as quickly as it came it departed. It went, yes. Uh, because I was like, that's great. We can. I've got plenty of time to, you know, when we were planning this out back in October. Yes. Or whenever the fuck it was. Yeah. Uh, I was like, great, I've got loads of time to watch it. And then when I went around to watching it, I was like, oh, it's not there. Yeah. Uh, I see it's had a trim 77 minutes long. It's is... lovely and short. It's Ooh. lovely and short. And do you know what? It's really fun. It zips along. There's a lot of kind of wacky comedy. Uh, it's, it's very... 
sweet and quaint and fun like i say it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna terrify you or leave you with sleepless nights that's for sure um you could almost show this to kids i think but it's a really fun little folk story uh so there you go so that is v from 1967 that's first on our list what's next um so i'm just going to quickly mention a couple that are not we're not going to do in in depth but we're just going to uh acknowledge because we're doing it in day order Mm -hmm. uh we neither of us got the chance to catch the dunwich horror no which i believe is quite lovecraftian yeah so it certainly sounds it with the word dumb witch in it yeah yes. well, oh yeah that, that immediately and yeah. uh, the mephesto walks uh sorry guys we didn't get time so, you know we've been we've both been in berlin exactly that, that's, our, that's our excuse we've had stuff going on but uh but both again both apparently interesting occult movies if you want to check those two out uh okay what's next on the list the actual one we're going to talk about is sergio martino's all the Colours of the Dark mm. from So Sergio Martino is Italian horror royalty to a certain degree. Uh, he before you know before and after this uh, made Torso, yeah, where whores meet sores. <laughs> uh, your vo- vice is a locked room, and only I have the key. An amazing title, and uh, the strange vice of Mrs. Ward. Huh. Uh Because there's a weird H on the end of it and I don't understand it. Amongst other sort of splattery, stupid things from the 1980s. Um, So All the Colors of the Dark is uh, about a woman who's played by Edwige Finesh. Mm -hmm. Big 70s pinup. Eyebrows and eye game, strong. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's about a woman recovering from a car accident in which she lost her unborn child, Mm -hmm. only to find herself pursued by a coven of devil worshippers love it classic so it starts with this nightmarish kind of fractured mirrored um hellscape of uh, of these three women in, in a room and then there's like an old hag type woman with teeth missing and she's farting around there's a pregnant woman in stirrups and spa- uh, sort of covered in blood and then our titular character and they all fall victim to this piercing blue-eyed killer nice who she believes to be stalking her mm-hmm. so basically what happens is her and her, hu- uh, her husband are dealing with this kind of tragic incident he makes her drink purple juice which i never apparently he's like a vitamin or vitamin vitamin what the fuck wow. am I what's happened to you <laughs> <laughs> i've been spending time many times with yanks yeah is exactly the problem. this is it um vitamin um, he's not a doctor per se, but he's like a vitamin salesman oh and he's like harking all this stuff. That sounds dodgy to me. Exactly. Um, halfway through the film, there is an amazing underground scene mm-hmm. on the London Underground because the film is set in London. Uh. As a matter of fact, they are riding on the Central Line, uh. which is apropos as that is the ninth circle of hell in, <laughs> some, in summer. Very good. Very good. Uh, it really is. So this, this film kind of struck me as it's very heavily influenced by Rosemary's Baby. Right. Yeah. It's yeah, four yeah. years after. It's, uh, but it, it's sexier. Yeah, sure. And there is actually no baby involved, really. It's about her. Um, so given the director is this is this quite Jallo-esque in its yeah. style yeah yeah it's one of those classic kind of early 70s I was expecting to see J&B whiskey in every shot <laughs> uh, the, the, yeah. the, the things that you're always looking out for it's also kind of got a possession vibe to it uh-huh. and also a bit of repulsion Ooh, and kind okay. of that like horny yes sort of sexy but weird yeah Sexy but weird. Sexy but you. weird. That's uh, all it says on my Tinder profile. We're gonna get. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No one uses Tinder. I joke. Um, <laughs> but I really recommend it. It's highly stylized and it's got that kind of silly, weird Italian giallo tone to it. Mm-hmm. But about a bunch of sexy devil worshippers that just want to shag and kill. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so that is all the colours of the dark. All the colours. I of really. The dark. I'm just looking at the poster. The poster like, is good stuff. So the it? poster is just a, a a seemingly naked or at least topless woman with this kind of demonic hand grabbing her on the boob. 
that's that's, that's one for the like uh, if you're going to decorate the house i'd put it in the in the bathroom <laughs> it's a good one isn't it it's, it's a not, good one it's not a bad one uh excellent all right let's move on what's next uh so i'm just going to do another quick breach touch point which is belladonna of sadness mm-hmm. it was another one that i wanted to cover but haven't had time and also we can't talk about all these films there's, there's too many to get through no so we are going to be talking about 1975's race with the devil Two men on a dream vacation. What the hell are they doing? I shouldn't think they killed her. Back! Frank, they've seen us. And get trapped in an unbelievable nightmare. Turn off the light! Why? What's wrong? What are you guys up to? What? What? 20th Century Fox presents Race the Devil. We saw somebody murdered. What? Some sort of ritual across the river. A girl got stabbed. They're chasing us. Now, this one has been highly, 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 highly recommended by about 17,000 people. Agreed. Even even when I was doing folk horror, this one was one that everyone kept saying to cover as now, well. So it's been a while. Hand on heart, guys. I had not seen it until this morning. Hey. Uh, I woke up this morning and watched it. Uh, so it's directed by Jack Starrett, who did a few bits and pieces. He's predominantly known for being in Rambo. Oh. He's an actor, but he also did the a few bits and pieces. Oh, yeah. That guy. Yeah, 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 yeah he's yeah. looking at him. Yeah. Uh, it stars Peter Fonda and Warren Oates. And let me tell you, great, great sort of chemistry between the two leads. Great. Basically, it's about these um, two couples are vacationing together in an RV from Texas to Colorado to go skiing because they've never gone skiing. Uh, And they uh, stop off one night in a kind of secluded area. And these guys, I think, have something to do with motorcycles. Like they're kind of racing motorcycles or Mm -hmm. or improving motorcycles. That seems to be the inference of what I was getting from this morning. (laughs) Uh, And while they've stopped off on the RV, they notice across the way, looking through binoculars, as all middle-aged men would do in bushes, <laughs> um, a satanic ritual Brilliant. in which uh, they um, murder a virgin. It's an implied virgin. She's blonde, so she must be a virgin. Sure, it's exactly. the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's once again very similar to. Uh, so, so they go and report it. The police, you know the drill. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then ensues a massive, almost cross-country pursuit as these devil worshippers look to exact revenge for them gazing upon their ritual, uh, in which the film kind of goes from, once again, like a kind of Rosemary's Baby vibe, but predominantly, it reminded me a lot of Jewel. Right, that's what I was thinking, yeah. And the parallax view. The kind of... uh, it's basically just like a relentless pursuit and what I think is so interesting about this and Satanists and occultists in general is there are lots of these beautiful moments where it's swimming pool and um, you know that she's she, one of the one of the ladies in, in the film is kind of realizing that everyone is kind of staring at her uh-huh. and the beauty of Satanists much like communists <laughs> is that it could be your next door neighbor it could be anyone next door and it's that fear of it's fear of the normalized other and there's some great instances of this in this film where nothing appears to be what they seem. And behind each pearly veneery surface of, well, howdy there, folks. I'd like to take you out for a lovely steak dinner that melts in your mouth. There's these, there's this doubt about everyone's intentions and everyone's idealisms. And I think it's like something that's still incredibly prevalent today. You never know who to fucking Tory. Yeah. <laughs> For it's example, so true. For example, it's so true. Although there are quite a few dead giveaways. Well, I'm, we're not allowed. To, we're not allowed to be anti-conservatives oh, no, anymore. Yeah, sorry. To We've, I've gotten quite Quentin. a few. I've, I've gotten. I've gotten a few more comments about that actually. So we're, stop we're, being such a leftist horror. Limit. I know. So I'm not being. I'm not being political anymore. But uh, I get you there. And actually, this looks like it could have been a good film. We could have covered this in our exploitation almost, right? I was well. thinking that this yeah, morning. Yeah, it's really got those kind of like. Yeah, but they. The thing is, they are like outsiders of this community like mm-hmm. we've always talked about but they are from that area right so it's not it, it's almost a class but a class within the same subset of people yeah yeah um where I mean, they're quite rich they're driving in a thirty six thousand dollar rv which had a microwave and color tv what and, these, and they i mean i was looking at the money of that and i was like 36 grand in 1974 yeah shall we say uh that's a lot of that's a lot of cheese 
<laughs> it really is. That it is a really lot of is. cheese. I love it. So and Peter Fonda as well. So do you think this was just like cashing in on a bit of Easy Rider kind of fame as well? Pot- potentially, I think there's once again it's influenced by Rosemary's Baby. I think it, that really did kind of. It's, de- <laughs> it's definitely going to be a, a thing we keep saying for, through yeah. a lot of these films. Well, I think. Well, yeah, but it, it definitely feels like that kind of idea of like not being able to trust the people that you're closest to. I also think it really inspired Hills of Eyes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Just by the, you know, they're in an RV. Yeah. I mean, obviously the tone is different and the way things pan out is completely different, but this kind of thematic reminded Mm. me a lot of The Hills of Eyes. I bet. Yeah, I bet. So a couple of little tidbits. The director claimed he used real Satanists as extras. Excellent. Just to make it a bit more spicy. And it really does feel like this film is riding that kind of wave of the satanic panic Mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, the 60s and the 70s that kind of bled through into all of Americana. Uh, that is another film that we're not going to be talking about today, Satanic Panic 2019. Sorry. Yes, although there is a good interview on the website where Brad interviewed Chelsea Stardust. The I did. Director. That did happen. Uh, so you can go check that out still, evolutionofhorror.com. Uh, but yeah, that is another, that's another movie we, we won't have time to discuss yes. this week. Uh, uh, so that's Race with the Devil. I really recommend it. I really liked it. Um, it's kind of got like a, a, like a Hollywood feel to it, mm-hmm. but that kind of like new Hollywood. Yes. You know, you know that kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. Everything's fresh and there's some very nice camera movement there's some nice framing this yeah that kind um, of post bonnie and clyde post easy rider kind yeah of. yeah and it's like 90 minutes it's digestible as fuck I, like normally i struggle with any film of any length i don't know why i watch them to be honest <laughs> um but this one I, I, I had to do a little tactical pause because i like to have a little tactical cigarette about halfway through a film mm-hmm. just to gather my thoughts yeah and think about things and obviously not in the cinema that would be weird yeah no, no but no, no, at no. home and I paused there and I was like, oh, there's only like 20 minutes to go because I was that way invested. And that's normally a good sign that I'm uh, I'm enjoying something. Yeah, that is definitely a good sign. So everyone that recommended Race of the Devil, congratulations. You're very good. You Congrats. Did, yeah, you didn't make a sucky suggestion. I love it. Well, I am. I, I mean, again, people have, I've, I've not seen this film, but people have been recommending it to me for about two years now. So I will check it out. And it has officially been done. It's been on the podcast. We've talked about it. <laughs> it's done. Tick that off. Um, good. All right. Excellent. What's next? Uh, we are, I believe it's me again, isn't it? Um, or... or is it me? No, no, it's you. It's me. It's you. Okay, so next we're going to The Sentinel from 1977. There is danger everywhere. There is evil. Evil everywhere. Turn around, Allison. Look behind you. There is horror. There is darkness. I think Allison may die. But watching, waiting, warding off evil, there is hope. The Sentinel. Before Halloran, there was Father David Spinetti. Before him, Mary Thorin becomes Sister Mary Angelica. Father Matthew Halloran dies the same day that Allison Parker disappears and becomes Sister Teresa. I call it! Now this uh, this is really interesting this because I saw this for the first time last night before recording this and uh even putting on Twitter that I'd watched it a lot of people have strong opinions one way or the other about this film. I re- I read it. Yeah, yeah people, I read your... people really some people really hate it and um it's definitely a movie when I was reading about it that was really panned on on initial release. So it's directed by Michael Winner uh, of Death Wish etc. Car insurance fame. Yes, exactly. Car insurance fame. And uh and it's got a cr- pretty incredible cast as well. So we've got Christina Raines in the in the in the lead role but also Chris Sarandon. We've also got Christopher Walken, Jeff Goldblum there are a few little famous faces that pop. John that pop Carradine, in. Beverly D'Angelo. Yeah, Eli Wallach. There's there's a, yeah, Jerry. Richard oh, Dreyfus. Back. Richard Dreyfus. There's, it's, a, it's a pretty incredible cast for what is such a bonkers B-movie. Uh, so speaking of Rosemary's Baby, I mean, the plot is, according to IMDb, a young woman moves into an apartment in a building which houses a sinister evil. So again, we are very much in a post-Rosemary's Baby kind of film here. Um, yes. Uh, a woman, yeah, moves into an apartment block. She thinks there's something very weird and sinister going on. Are there actually Satanists or is this the classic crazy woman uh, who no men 
believe. So uh, it's that kind of story that plays out. And again, speaking of uh, films like Repulsion, it's definitely got elements of that to it as well. She is haunted by her past, this big trauma that happened in her past. Mm. Um, and again, so it's you never quite know what's real and what unreliable isn't. narrator exactly although we do obviously basically know that it's it's real it's satanists it's just that no one believes her really uh those bloody satanists they get everywhere uh so it is like you know the end of rosemary's baby when it goes a bit camp and it's like old people tiptoeing around naked and shouting hail satan it's like that tone through the whole film it's really fun it's really stupid uh and there are moments that are pretty bad but also i had a lot of fun watching it Uh, and you know speaking of checking the running time i never once checked the running time uh throughout this entire thing i thought it zipped along i thought it was really fun and it goes full-on bonkers at the end i i I, the thing i saw was a lot of people saying that the ending is is quite a gloopy yes uh sight to behold there's a there's a lot of gloopiness they are there's a lot of there's a lot of quite dodgy dated stuff too in that basically michael winner hires a bunch of sideshow performers to play evil satanists essentially so a lot of people with kind of physical deformities are there purely to be really scary and jump out (laughs) on people so it's almost like freaks stunt casting but in the 70s there's a little bit of freaks there's a little bit of the omen and there's a lot of rosemary's baby in here um it's really trashy but i kind of enjoyed it i thought it was really fun and there is actually one and I, i and i remember seeing this moment as soon as it had happened so i think it must have happened on one of those you know scariest scariest moments kind of countdowns or something um but there's one incredible jump scare where a naked man suddenly appears from behind a door which really got me as well it was very creepy it's your it's your your irrational fear of naked men i think <laughs> yeah. is, is, is well you know everything hangs so low it's where, just where, it's not where, right. why is it so gravity you cruel mistress. <laughs> I know. so uh yeah i i enjoyed it if you like rosemary's baby but with slightly less prestige uh I'd, I'd check out The Sentinel. I thought it was really fun. It's got some creepy moments and lots of very silly moments and lots of crazy Satanists uh, doing crazy stuff. Like there's one woman who... Um uh, one woman who you know she's evil because every time she sits down opposite our main character she just starts masturbating and uh, touching herself she seems, uh, have you got a number <laughs> <laughs> she seems great she's very you uh, yeah so uh, good fun I would definitely uh, recommend it sadly you can't stream it anywhere for free I did have to pay to rent it oh thank my you very much God. Um, but it's 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 worth a watch it was on Netflix I know I know and it's gone so there we go so that's The Sentinel from 1977 that's one I hadn't seen but I I do kind of want to check out i think it's i think it's, it's up your you, street you said the word trash so i'm <laughs> it is basically tra- it's it's a trash occult movie uh, i'm uh, i'm i'm on board with yeah, that yeah you're all for it i'm gonna bridge a divide now okay um because the next film we're going to talk about is um a decade later ah okay right yeah yeah what could we bridge that gap with between 1977 and 1987. So we need like an early 80s occult movie, right? No, what no? we need is the sequels to The Omen. Of course. The terror of the past is but a taste of the future. What happened before was a hint of the horror to come. The first time was only a warning. William Holden, Lee Grant, Damien, Omen 2. Tell me about Damien. What sort of a boy is he? He's your brother's son. He's a boy you've loved for seven years. Well, you can't believe this. And? It's over. It is a filthy, stupid story, and it's over. The current's got him! Yes, now, of course, we did our big deep dive into The Omen, but a lot of people, there are a lot of fans of The Omen sequels, particularly The Omen 2, I think. Damien The Omen 2 is, like, it sticks out... Well, no, I mean, The Omen sticks out to me because from where I'm from is quite near Guildford. Guildford Cathedral was a big plot for the first one where Damien goes mad as they're driving up the thingy. Yes. I went to a uh, school trip there when I was 11. I love it. And I said, did you know... (laughs) Did you know that this was filmed from The Omen? (laughs) And my teacher rang my parents and was like, why does he know 
<laughs> about the omen at 11. That's amazing. And my mother said he's fundamentally broken. We, there's not much. Yeah, there's we, nothing we, there's we, not can much do. we can do. It's too far. Him. He's too far gone. That's really interesting because Becky Dark, who was on the podcast talking about the omen, had that exact same story because she obviously grew up she's in the from, same area well, as you. She's the babysitter. She, <laughs> there you go. A little tidbit. I don't know if we've ever said that on the podcast. No, it's never been formally acknowledged to the general public. But, but this was before like really you guys had properly met since since you were a child yes right was that it and it turned out that becky was your childhood babysitter which is absolutely yeah. hilarious and she used to let me watch porn oh well there you go they so so basically we've got her to blame for why she, you are the, the way the, the reason are. i am fundamentally broken there are two things there was one time i was trying to show off in my bo- jurassic park box shorts and a, a jurassic park <laughs> t-shirt i did a flip over the sofa and my dick fell out <laughs> And her and the other girl that were babysitting laughed at me, which would explain why. <laughs> a Explains lot, a lot. A lot of Freudian issues <laughs> there with my penis, uh, and also, yeah, she was. She facilis- She just ruined me, basically. She ruined you. And then she came up to me at Fright Fest two years ago and was like, "Hi, I used to babysit you," and shattered my tiny little mind. Oh, that I used is... to have a crush on her. Oh, there obviously. You go. Oh, Obviously, who doesn't have a crush on that baby? I, mean, I, have a, I still have a crush on Becky Dark now. So exactly, exactly. Who, who, who among us doesn't? You're so. only human. So there you go. So you both grew up in Guildford, both loving the Omen. Uh, so that's just, so. So yeah, let's get back to the scene. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> that little sorry. aside. Uh, my therapy session. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Up. I'll take that up with him later. Um, so yeah, the second the second one's directed by Don Taylor and stars uh, Jonathan Scott Taylor as Damien. He mm-hmm. didn't really do a lot after that. Now two scenes of the, the Omen's two that are like forever ingrained in my mind Mm -hmm. we're talking i don't know how much spoilers we're doing but fuck it that's all right we can talk about a couple of moments in isolation um it's gotta be bird ipec semi or mac a semi truck yeah my god that like that image of her kind of lunging forward um unable to obviously blinded and then getting absolutely fucking creamed by a truck like it's still quite a visceral memory from the first time I saw it yep. on a janky VHS years yeah. and years and years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, the elevator scene, man. Yeah. Well, it's great. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because, I mean, we should say, so The Omen 2 is basically it's set a few years on. Damien is a sort of early teen, isn't And it's he? been adopted by, like, his uncle? Yeah. And and they definitely do the, the, the classic sequel thing of, like, what did people love about the first one? The kind of elaborate kill scenes. And it, they kind of push... The, pre- the precursor to Final Destination. Exactly. And they definitely kind of push that even further with the second one, don't they? And, 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 and they really go to town on some of those moments. Yeah. So, I mean, the occultism and the Satanism takes a, a little bit of a yeah. back... There's not so much, you know, look up here, Damon, it's all for you. No. And there's no, like, evil dogs and bits and pieces of that. But uh, yeah, aren't they in a military academy? Yes, or like a posh a posh Pri- school or something, school. a boarding school or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the third one, uh, The Final Conflict, Sam Neill. I know. Sam, Sam Neill's Neil. playing Damon. It's directed by Graham Baker. But nothing fucking happens in that movie. I can't tell you one other than Sam Neill being kind of menacing and sexy. Yeah. Which, uh, if I want menacing and sexy, I'll watch In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, like, watch In the Mouth of Madness. Watch Event Horizon. There are there are other movies you can you, watch. Possession. Like, yeah, there are loads. Exactly. There are loads that he can, you, you can do that. And like this one just feels a bit just like they focus too much on the politics and the kind of yeah. climbing of that rather than and the, the, the kind of demonic or Satanist ideals kind of almost get nudged to the side yeah then there was a fourth one i've never seen the i've never one. seen it either it's a o- new story right Omen for the awakening it was made for tv it features a, fi- uh, a young girl who's damien's daughter because damien's dead right yeah um but i've just written here omen for the awakening dash who the fuck knows <laughs> um is there anyone out there that's seen the omen four? and if so let us know what, what it's like because i've ne- i've never met anyone that's seen it it's no. just out there i used to have the I, I used to have the collection i might yeah. still have it well i have actually i ha- yeah i've got it it's the, yeah. qu- qu- the pen- quadrilogy oh yeah, yeah it's the one because it's also got the Liev schreiber the, the, the that 2006 one, well. one yeah uh yeah which had mia farrow in which i yeah, completely forgot right. about that's right uh, just to bring it back to rosemary's baby again yes. just for a laugh uh here's a bit of trivia for you mm. let's see if you get this this oh, is no. goes out to obviously goes out to the rest of you i'm gonna leave a little pause mm. who is the only actor to appear in more than one omen film interesting interesting i will take either the uh the character name because you won't know the actor no um i'm sure there are people right now screaming there, mm. so technically there is another one but they play a different character in a, in a later ep- one so I'm not counting that this is the same actor playing the same character in two Omen films only time it happens no one else comes back 
other than flashbacks and shit like that. Right. I don't know. I would take a punt at maybe like one of the priests in Italy or something like that. It's Carl Bugenhagen. Mm. You know Bugenhagen. Who's that? The kind of like big fat guy with the beard. Oh. Leo McKern. Okay. There you go. There is. Wow. There's some trivia. For you. I love it. I love it. He is the only character to ever appear in a second because, you know, Damien is proficient. Yes. Uh, fucking wiping that slate clean. Yeah, he is. He <laughs> is. It, no one really gets out of those. And that's the quite nice thing about it is that you could watch each film just as its own film, really. You, you, you barely even have to watch them in order, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, they're very different. Yeah. I mean, they are kind of like isolated. Yeah. Pretty incidents. Much. And they, I mean, it, I think one and two kind of go hand in hand. But the third one, I'd say. Yeah. That was a taut political drama. Yes, exactly. Quite. No, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so they go good, good. I'm glad we managed to include a bit of a bit of the omen in there. Uh, so that's the omen two, three and four. Two we would both recommend. Yeah. And three is boring. Uh, so now we're going to talk about 1987's The Believers. More than anything else. Cal Jameson wants to leave the horror of his old life behind. No! No! Now in his new life, he's about to discover that the real horror is just beginning. Don't you come any closer! Did you see what they did to the yeah, kid in there? You said he found the body on an altar with a lot of religious paraphernalia, right? A religion as old as time. One life from each of us count. Versus an unimaginable force for evil. This ritual's being performed now. One life is all the answer. Nothing can stop them. It's a power you can't imagine. Want them to know who you are? Do you? What have they done to you, Sean? I can't move. No one can help you. I got my shield. Don't you get it? You looked into his eyes, and you both are the power of the man who killed them. Jessica! They know. Have you seen this? I have not seen this. So this was directed by um, a fucking like Hollywood titan, John Schlesinger, who did Midnight Cowboy. Oh, yeah. Marathon yeah. Man, Billy Liar, uh, Day of Locusts. Yo, he's made some fucking great films. This film is also written by Mark Frost, as oh in God. Twin, of Peaks, Twin Peaks Mark fame. Frost. Oh, my God. And you haven't seen it. I know. Shame on me. Uh, this film is cool. Uh, so the plot synopsis is mourning the accidental death of his wife, which I will get to in a minute, and having moved into New York with his young son, laconic police psychologist, Car- Cal Jameson, Martin fucking Sheen, oh, Martin. Um, is reluctantly drawn to a series of grisly ritualistic murders involving the immolation of two youths. Nice. This one's got 80s written all <laughs> over it. Um, it's a really interesting um, film. I wouldn't say it is a great film. Uh-huh. I think the problem is with these new Hollywood directors, as he came to fruition mainly in the 70s, yeah. when they get to the 80s, a lot of them, they yeah. start sucking. They do. This one, I had only seen this recently, and I spoke to a friend of the pod, Giles Edwards, about this while I was in... Berlin. I met up with him and I had a chat and I said, uh, I'm doing this is the list of them thinking the covers and he was like, You have to do the believers. <laughs> now at that point I hadn't seen the believers. Right, right, right. I've seen the believers. Yeah. Um so what it's kind of it reminded me a bit of Candyman. Okay. Interesting. In terms of it's basically these forces, uh, it's you know, it's, you can look at it as a cult and Satanist and ritualistic, but there's also kind of this this fear of the other because it's a predominantly black Afro Americans right. that are um, are kind of embroiled in this mystery. Interesting, and um, the son kind of um, is almost drawn to uh, the kind of totemic uh, sort of iconography of it. So like the weird chains and. Uh, they have a, a, a sort of a, a Latino housekeeper who's doing her, you know, her, her spells to ward off evil spirits and putting things under beds and making shrines and bits and pieces. So nice. These, these are, t- you know, he's a very white, straight laced man being thrust into this b- boiling pot of culture in New York. Right. Okay. Interesting. While simultaneously dealing with perhaps the most elaborately elaborately set electrocution I have ever seen in my fucking life. Uh, Once again, it almost plays like a final destination when his wife dies at the beginning of the film, which is not a spoiler because it's in the plot summary. 
but I'm going to talk about it because it is so funny. So he's at, he goes to get in the shower and the wife's cooking breakfast because patriarchal norms. Yeah. Uh, the son's watching uh, mum cook breakfast and whatever. And during the, the everything, um, there's, I think, a, like a blender going. Uh, and Uh-oh. at some point, milk gets spilled. Uh-oh. And her feet are now in the milk because the blender starts going mad and she's trying to clean up the milk. But then he's like, the blender's going mad. So she goes to turn the blender off. Electrocution, standing in the milk. Oh my, it's like the opening of a casualty episode or something. And it's literally got this really funny scene of her, like the kid <laughs> screaming. It keeps cutting back to her kind of, I can't, I mean, I'm doing the face, but like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. Kind it, of convulsing and yeah. Uh, and as soon as it finished, I, I couldn't help just being like, no use crying over spilled milk. Yeah, of course. I was, I was, I mean, I was that, waiting for you to say that. That was where it was, mate. Yeah. That's where it was. Yeah. So he goes to go and see his his, his lawyer friend, mm-hmm. who is a magician, naturally. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> he's also one of the best characters in this film. Okay. Like, so he's this kind of like shyster lawyer mm-hmm. um, who... Um, is trying to help him like sue the blender company, I assume, right. for killing his wife. That is like a weird uh, sidebar. And then obviously it gets drawn into this kind of a, a cultist slaying where um, it turns out, it, it, once again, kind of getting get out vibes from it mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. bit. The, the, these, there's a, a, a rich, white, powerful man who is, you know, a, philanthropi- a, a philanthropist. It's mm-hmm. a really hard word to it say. It is, it is. Uh, who's kind of, you know, has been championed for, you know, um, economically regenerating, regenerating kind of impoverished areas of New York City. Yeah. And it turns out, though, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's got, evil. He's because he's trying to bring his dead son back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. It's natural. Yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah. what you were doing. He's enlisted... This um, shaman. Yeah. Bit of mysticism, bit of magic. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, like a really interesting kind of portrait of like New York City in the 1980s mm-hmm. where like, obviously we've just had the slasher boom as well. So for something to exist mm. in this kind of, I'd say akin to, it kind of it reminds me of Get Out. It reminds me of Candyman, but obviously this is a precursor to have this kind of bizarre kind of cop procedural voodoo occult yeah it's i mean that's interesting because we talked a little bit about this era during the occult series and there were a lot of cop procedurals there was like angel heart which was this same year and that feels like it has a kind of similar vibe with the sort of the voodoo meets procedural thriller even the exorcist 3 a little bit has that kind of procedural meets occultness and it just Um, seems maybe it's of the time people were like people like cop procedurals yeah yeah yeah, we're in like Thomas Harris kind of ville here. Yeah, interesting. Um, so yeah, that's the believers. I really liked it. I didn't love it, but I think it's an interesting thing. It's a little it, interesting little it, thing. It's an interesting thing that exists. And you know, Martin Sheen. It's always Martin good. Sheen. Mark always Frost. Good. Mark Frost. Come on, John Schlesinger. Come um, on. Yeah, that is available to rent on Amazon. There you go. If anyone fancies coughing up two pound forty nine to see it, a bargain. Uh, a bargain. There we go. All right, that's the believers. What's next? We're talking about 1989. We're talking about Steve Miner. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about Warlock. He has the face of an angel. Channel me a spirit. The charm of the devil. Hear me when I say he's evil. Evil absolute. And the powers of a god. <laughs> Satan also has one son. The first to have laid eyes upon the new messiah. Now, an enemy from his past. Who appointed you executioner? And a girl from the present. Do you know what he's capable of? Next time he's gonna kill me. I'll not let him harm you. Are the only hope for the future. (laughs) This is the terrifying adventure that could set the world on fire. Warlock. Now this film, man, 
This film fucking rules. I've, yeah, I've not seen Warlock, but again, this one came highly recommended from a lot of people as I'm well. A, I'm a big fan of Warlock, so I'll give you the, the quick plot synopsis. A warlock flees from the 17th century to the 20th century with a witch hunter in hot pursuit. A warlock is taken captive in Boston, Massachusetts in 1961 by a witch hunter, Giles Redfern. He is sentenced to death for his act, uh, activities, uh, including the bewitching of Redfern's bride-to-be, but before the execution of the demon, a demon appears and propels the warlock forward in time to the 20th century Los Angeles and Castro, uh, catastrophe reigns. Oh, I love it. The tagline, he's come from the past to destroy the future. And uh, there's another tagline of Satan also has one son. <laughs> I don't, I, that's I don't, weird. I don't, I don't know. So this is obviously directed by Steve Miner, mm-hmm. who did Friday the 13th Part 2, yeah. Friday the 13th Part 3, Halloween H2O, Lake Placid, House. Oh my God, what a filmography. He's got some good shit, man. Yeah. So this also stars the incomparable Julian Sands, <laughs> Julian who Sands. honestly... I bet you love Julian Sands, I love don't you? Yeah, I, I bet you do. I fucking love <laughs> Julian Sands. It also stars Richard E. Grant. Oh, wonderful. I love Richard E. Grant. I've just got to um, catch the warlock. Oh, um, brilliant. He he plays Giles Redfern, the witch hunter from the... Because the, they both get... It's basically the fish out... The classic fish out of the water yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's so weird. So he's basically trying to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> impregnate a woman to bring forth you know his warlock brethren right to the 20th century so you've got that classic kind of campy fish out of water oh a stereo player yeah, blah 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 classic. blah classic I love that um, it's like like enchanted yes <laughs> yes but, but evil but different mm. um it's also uh, so it's, it's but it's, it's really cheesy it's really schlocky it's really gory yeah the practical effects here it also spawned uh three sequels uh warlock the armageddon which i fuck with hard that oh, one is really that one is great big fan of that that one's on amazon prime because mm-hmm. i watched it there recently and they were, oh and they also made no i'll tell you like it's only three warlock three the end of innocence excellent so there's a uh, they, they the first two came thick and fast and then the, set, the third one came out in about 1995 um i love it it's also quite thematically similar to another series we're going to talk about in a second and also another series the prophecy the christopher walken movies yeah 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 the one that had vigo mortensen as satan yeah yes uh so it's quite similar to them, and it's quite similar to the other thing we're going to talk about, but we're going to do a proper one on that. Um, but do you know anything, and this is weird, about Sandy Charles? No. We're about to go motherfucking true crime on this podcast. Oh, God. Okay. This isn't like Victor Salva again, is it? It's not Nancy. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> For once. Thank God. Uh, it's still not fun, though. No. So here we go. I'm going to try and change my cadence to make this a bit more dramatic. Good, good. Um, in 1995, Sandy Charles, a 14-year-old boy, took it upon himself to kill a seven-year-old boy. Oh, fuck. It's like Jamie Bolger. Very much like mm. Jamie Bolger, uh, in which he cooked and uh, cut and cooked strips of flesh and fat from the boy's body in a ritual that he said was inspired by, by Warlock. Warlock. Oh, shit. God. Um, the young boy, Jonathan uh, George Timpson, uh, was stabbed with a knife and then beaten with a beer bottle and a rock in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, and he, the boy was found guilty of, um, was found not guilty by reason of insanity and is in a psychiatric hospital. Wow. Uh, and I've got the official thing here. It says, after watching the movie Warlock 10 times, 14-year-old Sandy Charles of Saskatchewan killed an 8-year-old boy, a 7-year-old boy, by stabbing him with a knife and then beating him with a beer bottle and a rock. After killing the boy, Charles cut strips of uh, skin from the victim and boiled them down. Uh, Warlock in the film claimed that if you drank boiled down fat from a virgin, it would give you the ability to fly, and Charles wanted to fly. Jesus Christ. That is dark. And then they made a third one. They ma- So they made a sequel since that happened. Yeah. Wow. I'm surprised it didn't get the original banned. It's the sort of thing that back in the 90s would have got, would have get, got the I'm, film banned. I'm guessing or- because it happened in Canada and not in the UK. Like, yeah. I'd never heard of it, but 
upon doing my research yeah wow i told you it was juicy that is juicy jesus christ that's horrible isn't it yeah. i mean what is it with people blaming movies like that so i mean this kid does very it, yeah the, the charles play three thing there are similarities to what happens in charles play three and what the boys did mm -hmm. but they never explain they did see the film but they never say that they was no. inspired this kid was like i watched warlock and i wanted to fly <laughs> like that's insane isn't it wow. and i think about the other films i've watched 10 times and whether it would make me do anything crazy but i don't think there's any biodomes <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to no, lighten the mood exactly, exactly yeah perfect. there's no biodomes around here so me and my birdie couldn't well, get stuck in there so true crime aside though you'd you'd recommend warlock. Oh, i fucking love the warlock series yeah. it's a bit of me though isn't it it's fucking stupid camp nonsense yeah uh, so it's it's it seems like I mean it's classed here on IMDb as kind of action fantasy first yeah. horror second kind yeah. of thing yeah it, it, I would say it's it, you know it's almost like Masters of the Universe a yeah. little bit in, yeah. In, yeah. in terms of but with really overt gory horror kills great so that's that why sounds good I mean that's that's all you really really need from the film yeah that's your jam um, that is my jam love it all right so that's Warlock okay so where are we going now I uh, just want to briefly mention we've oh, yeah, got a chance to do uh, the first power with Lou Diamond Phillips oh yeah 1990s I thought that was Jerry O'Connell to begin with no, on the poster Lou yeah. Diamond Phillips yeah 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 he uh, that, I, neither of us got a chance to see this but once again it's a, a cop procedural Satanist movie yes so Good. All right. Check that out. If you're a, if you are a completionist, check, check out the first power. The um, first power. But uh, I want to talk about. <laughs> This is the one that when you posted a blurry image of it, people thought it was Naked Gun. And they, and they were closer they than were they thought. They were very close. Um, I want to talk about 1990s Repossessed. <laughs> At this point, Michael, I would like you to hit me with a theme song. I was a man of my business when the devil walked in on me. Oh, no. Waving his hand said, come on, just follow me. <laughs> so I, I looked him in the eyes and I showed him to the door. Oh, no. And I told him to get lost because I've been there once before. Don't Re, 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 repossess. Re, 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 repossess. Do you want to get re, 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 repossess? Re, 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 <laughs> it's kind of got like a sister act vibe to the fuck knows. I love it. Have you ever seen re Repossess? When I was a kid, because I remember watching this and Dracula Dead and Loving It. Uh, they were on TV one after the other one night. Um, but I can't really remember much about it because I get in my head confused between this and the opening scene of Scary Movie 2 with the exorcism happening in that film. Yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult to... to yes, yeah. yes. What I really love about this film is that Linda Blair came back and actually played a... That's a right. version of herself. That's right. She's Nancy Aglet in this film, whatever. But, you know, and uh, Ned Beatty's in it and obviously Leslie Nielsen as we, yes. as we know. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to touch on it for too long because there is not much to say. It is a spoof comedy from Bob Logan uh, who did uh, Meatballs 4, <laughs> if you're wondering. Um, but I've got like such a soft spot for it because it really reminds me of my childhood growing up watching this film. And I remember renting it from my video store yeah. numerous times. And I watched it uh, maybe a couple of years ago, so it's not entirely fresh in my mind. But I still really dig... Um, like the, the those the, the kind I, I mean I'm a sucker for horror spoofs in yeah general, or spoofs in general and there were a lot around this time weren't yeah. there Silence of the Hams big fan of that yeah like H huge fan I, Fate, Fatal Instinct Fatal Instinct yeah, I yeah. know I know I just had to watch that for work recently hilarious yeah hilarious there was a lot of them it was very popular at this time wasn't it and Leslie you can't go wrong with Leslie Nielsen I mean you can't go wrong like, so it's stupid funny. and whatever and it, I think it's quite difficult to track down now so if you can find a copy well done yeah uh, but honestly I fucking love it uh, and I just I, I like when else am I going to get a chance <laughs> to talk to, about repossessed to, to, to get repossessed <laughs> mentioned in a conversation while we're talking about the believers and yes exactly the, and all the, all the colours of the dark repossessed love it if you haven't seen it watch it it's a great little spoof I mean I think hasn't it got like a game show exorcism at the end oh th yes now and then that reminds me of um, another film from around this area called Stay Tuned. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this film? No, that doesn't sound familiar. Right. So st st I'm just a brief aside. Stay Tuned, uh, I think is actually directed by one of the directors we're going to talk about. Uh, this film is John Ritter. And oh, I this, love John basically, Ritter. they get like a, a satellite dish 
uh, installed and it gives them access to all the cable in the world, but they get sucked into the TV and start having to live out all these crazy weird shows that they exist in. Oh, I love, I love set premises like that. Oh, I, honestly, 1992, Stay Tuned, directed by Peter Himes, who will come up in conversation later, uh, is a great film. I was so excited to talk about that film that I've skipped it. It should be mentioned later. <laughs> but we were talking about game show exorcisms and yes. then it reminded me of Stay Tuned. So. Yeah, absolutely. So there we have it. That's there we how go. we got there. Uh, so there we go. We, 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 via Stay Tuned there, we were talking about Repossessed. Repossessed. So Repossessed. There, there's that one. Uh, excellent. If you're a fan of horror spoofs, this is the ultimate occult spoof. So there you go. It's Repossessed. the closest you're ever going to get. Exactly. Uh, okay, where are we going next? We're heading into the 90s now, right? We're about to get into like peak new metal. Yeah, 90s but, grunge. You know, Kind my of, new metal horror that yeah. I love. We are going to be talking about uh, 1997's Wishmaster. For centuries, he has remained hidden, watching, waiting. And now, he is coming. He knows your secret hopes, he sees your private dreams. And he can grant your every desire. Well, I'm not a <laughs> greedy man. How about a million dollars? I remember a certain potentate whose last party was talked about for centuries. Oh, God, how I'd love to host a party like that. I wish to be beautiful forever. Even if it kills you. As you wish. I fuck with Wishmaster so hard. Yeah, I, w I don't remember Wishmaster very well at all. I definitely, I remember watching it from my video shop when I was younger. I definitely didn't see the sequels, but I remember enjoying, it's quite nasty, isn't it? The it's really misanthropic. Yeah, like, it, it is. fucking hates everyone. So it's directed by Robert Kurtzman mm -hmm. of KMB, uh -huh. uh, which would explain why this film goes off the deep end with the practical effects right, in yeah. terms of what it is. So the, 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 the plot synopsis is that the djinn, having been released from his ancient prison, seeks to capture the soul of the woman that discovered him, thereby opening a portal and freeing his fellow djinn to take over the earth. Very similar to Warlock. Yep. Um, starring the chew scenery-chewing Andrew Divoff mm -hmm. as the djinn, uh, and also has one of the uh, most impressively ensembled um, horror casts of all time. So you've got Kane Hodder. Oh, wow. Robert Englund. Oh, Tony wow. Todd. George Buck Flower, who was a frequent collaborator with John Cl uh, Carpenter. Uh, Joseph uh, Pilato, who was from Dawn and Day of the Dead. Yep. It's like a who's who uh, of um, horror, horror royalty. And it was the first time that this really happened. And I remember it being marketed as like, yes. this is the first time like Freddy and like Jason and, and Tony Todd's in it as well. So yeah. like Candyman and like this was uh, it was uh, like they're all together on the big screen i mean they're not like yeah. robert england plays like a i'm a slimy antique stealer <laughs> and kane hodder is like a big burly security guard yeah and, you know everyone's got their kind of little bits and pieces but the film was marketed like boys this Freddy, is it freddie and jason and candy man are in a film together but yeah. they ain't yeah, yeah. and it was written by uh, peter atkins who wrote Hellraiser 2, 3, and Bloodline, ah. which would explain why Andrew Divoff feels like he's doing a pinhead line reading. Right, that's kind of how I remember it. Because yeah. he's like, choose your three yes. wishes. That's it. I remember it feeling quite Hellraiser-esque. Um, so the film starts and ends with these kind of like two opulent parties that end in these kind of like visceral disgusting kind of blood orgies blood orgies <laughs> yeah and it kind of reminded me of like society's like shunting yeah do you know what i mean where like flesh and everything is just like melded and combined and like yeah. you know what i think is quite interesting is you know they've, they've got like a man snake hybrid slithering around and flesh is being torn away and there's like a skeleton just walking around mm -hmm. and it's all immensely mean-spirited and immensely creative chaotic practical effects that kind of remind me of like Barker and Craven and Gordon and Yasna and sort of yes. those people thing. And he's kind of part pinhead, part Kruger in the way that he's constructed uh, the gin. Yeah. Like yeah. his idea, like, like, cause he kind of, the thing is like, what do you wish for the most? Uh, which brings me back to, brings me to fucking fantasy Island. Uh, <laughs> but I don't want to talk about <laughs> which that. Which you've just watched. I've literally just watched this. and I'm annoyed. Um, and, it, and the film is like very aware of what it is and it knows its limitations. So it plays to its strength, which is let's make this fucking gross, gory. I don't know if you remember the scenes with like a bum and he's like, I hope he gets cancer. <laughs> and then like actually 
physically embodies cancer and there's like yellow pus which is a nice nod to phantasm there love it uh like emanating from all his wounds and sores that have come on like from an instant and it's just this like you know be careful what you wish yeah for, the kind classic of, kind of monkey paw be careful what you wish for yeah it's great uh so it spawned three sequels uh the Wishmaster two evil never dies mm-hmm. big fan of that one mm-hmm. uh wish master three beyond the gates of hell and uh, Wishmaster 4, The Prophecy Fulfilled. Wow, I didn't know there were as many as four. Amazing. They are. There you go. But yeah, I love Wishmaster so fucking much. I think love Michael it. Blythe programmed it at the BFI. Definitely. Which we are currently sat in, yes. I just realised. Yeah, it's definitely been on at the BFI. Uh, and I, I think I told him that I loved him when he can't. Because <laughs> that film rules. Yeah. We're going to just jump along with these because they're all in about the same time. So the next one we'll be going to from Wishmaster in the new metal horror canon. Mm-hmm is 1999's Stigmata. It is some sort of attack. Wrists are bandaged. We're investigating this one. Miss Page, I travel around the world investigating miracles. Do you know what the Stigmata are? Five wounds. His back was scourged by whips or nails driven through his hands and feet. Only deeply devout people have been afflicted. These wounds. Which church do you attend? I don't go to church. All stigmatics suffer the most intense demonic attacks. Directed by Rupert Wainwright, Mm -hmm. who you will obviously know from your massive affinity of his work remaking The Fog. (laughs) Of course, yeah. Uh, Oh dear. So Rupert was, bless him, uh, mainly a uh, music video maker mm-hmm. and it very much shows in mm. stigmata mm. he also uh, directed blank check with macaulay culkin and yeah so i i'm a big fan of stigmata because you've got gabriel byrne playing the priest yeah you've got patricia arquette um exhibiting st- the signs of stigmata and yeah. once again i remember seeing this film when i was in my teens and being kind of like at the time, blown away by it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Like, Me too. Hand, uh, ha- like bleeding from the eyes and holes in her wrists and hands and bits and pieces. You watch it now. Mm, not it's, so good. It's not very good. Uh, I, yeah, no, I haven't seen it since it was first out either. I remember thinking that it, it wasn't quite as... Even when I watched it at the time, it was more of a sort of drama thriller than it was a horror or as much horror as I wanted it to yeah, be. Yeah, once again, I think it goes to that procedural line of yeah. like Gabriel, but it's more about Gabriel when investigating whether she laying or not. A little bit like... Um, the Exorcism of Emily Rose, too, which we haven't included, but that's a similar thing as well, right? It's that kind of like courtroom drama, more almost than it of is like, a, like, yeah, like, but so, the, but this one's got this fucking annoying way of being edited and cut, where it's yeah. all just quick cuts and flashes, and mm. and like looks like a Nine Inch Nails video or, or whatever he was yeah. going for at the time. Yeah, uh, but the briefs, yeah, we've mentioned it, but the, so basically, it's Frankie Page is having strange and violent experiences, showing the wounds of Christ. Uh, the Vatican is his word, so they send a high-ranking cardinal, uh, Andrew Kierman, which is Gabriel Byrne. Soon Kierman realizes that the very sinister forces are at work and tries to rescue Frankie from the entity that is plaguing her. Yes. So it's Constantine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Which we could, I guess we could have done Yeah, we should have added that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, kind of part of this whole era as well, isn't it? But whatevs. Constantine mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, uh, that's that's pretty much it with Stigmata, isn't it, really? Yeah, exactly, which is why we're going to quickly jump along. Back to Peter Hyams, director of Stay Tuned. And we're back to more Gabriel Byrne, right? Except this time, oh. in the same year, Gabriel Byrne is playing the fucking devil. Oh, yeah, he is. It's, Chewing the scenery as well. Oh, my God. It's yeah. end of days. And oh, I like this film. Yeah, it's and fun. It's I don't really care fun. that everyone says it's shit. It's <laughs> fucking cool, man. <laughs> Get down on the ground. You don't know what you've done. You said here the guy spoke to you. Yeah, so what? The guy doesn't have a tongue. Listen to this. I've seen the earth laid to waste. Take it easy. You're the good guys. They tried to kill me. Why? She's been chosen. Chosen for what? If the dark angel consummates your flesh with this human body before midnight on New Year's Eve, then he unlocks the gate of hell. Ah! There are some interesting things about this film as well in terms of um, its existence. Right. Um, so this is, for people that don't know, it's basically Arnold Schwarzenegger versus the devil, right? And of course. Versus a bunch of demons and things. Yes. It's great fun. 
Yeah, so I'll just I'll do my usual bits and pieces. So Peter Hyman's director of Stay Tuned. He also directed St- Time Cop. Uh huh. Yeah. Big fan of that. And also the 2010, the sequel to 2001. You've got to have some real fucking oh. balls to make the sequel to 2001. <laughs> So on December 28th, 1999, the citizens of New, citizens of New York are getting ready to turn uh, to the millennium because there was obviously a big techno, you mm. know, Y2K fear at this time. Mm-hmm. However, the, the, the devil has decided to crash the party by coming to the city, inhabiting a man's body and searching for his chosen bride. I believe the man's body is obviously Gabriel Byrne. He's, I think he's a Wall Street banker. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think. sounds about right. Uh, a 20 year old woman named Christine York. Uh, the world will end, and only hope lies with atheist hero named Jericho <laughs> Kane. Yeah. What a fucking name, man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so Arnie's Jericho Kane, Gabriel Byrne is the devil, and Robin Tunney from The Craft. Indeed. Is, uh, is our Christine York. Um, I love it. You've also got Udo Kier in oh, this movie. There's some good shit in Miriam it. Miriam mean, Margulies. I love it. Yeah. Like the, the CCH Pounders in it as well. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Um, so um, there's some great instances of weirdness in this film. So for example, Arnie at one point wakes up in the morning and makes a smoothie mm-hmm. out of the following. Coffee, Pepto-Bismol, beer, leftover <laughs> Chinese food, and pizza that he all finds on the floor. <laughs> So, Jer- uh, so Arnie's playing like an anti-hero, which was like quite. Mm. I mean, obviously, you can look at like T one, yeah, Terminator two, and all that as like an anti-hero. Mm. But this one, he's really like a reluctant. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like when Tom Cruise does it, and you're like, this is really weird. And yeah, it is. Suddenly, you're like they're brave and bold for being dicks. Yeah, it's true because uh, like Terminator two onwards, Arnie kind of became this sort of cuddly hero. He then yeah. he then became kindergarten cop and jingle all the way guy, didn't he? But yeah, and like what happened is this is quite interesting is that um the role of Jericho Kane was originally offered to Tom Cruise. Mm, interesting, uh, and he chose to make Magnolia with PTA instead. Oh. Oh, his loss. His loss. <laughs> his loss is Arnie's game. Um, what's also interesting is that this was Arnie's first film back since Batman and Robin. Oh, my God. And I bet we... you love Batman and Robin, don't you? Of course I fucking yeah. do. Joel Schumacher, <laughs> yeah. the Lord and saviour. Uh, Arnie's first film back since Batman and Robin because he had a heart attack. Oh, my God. And this, yeah. this kicks back to Bradley's real job. Mm. Uh, the insurers were constantly on set to uh, keep an eye on Arnie because he'd come back from a heart attack and obviously like insuring him became like a fucking nightmare right. as you would imagine uh, until they realised that he was having the absolute fucking time of his life getting <laughs> the shit kicked out of him and <laughs> flying through windows and walls and whatever else he was doing and they were like we'll just leave him alone then he's having a great he's time he's fine he's fine, he's fine. Uh, yeah we should explain so your job is you are you insure films right I, I do mean, just for people that didn't know that yeah yeah. Uh, no that's, one cares. well there you go that is interesting and I think it's a really fun I haven't to be fair I haven't seen it in a number of years but I remember it being really fun there's some amazing quotes you know like there's a bit where he's like now you're making me angry and you don't want to see me when you're angry all right well that's eh, that's, that's already a bit of a that's that's been uh, done that's a rip-off but then Jericho <laughs> Kane fires back with oh you think you're bad huh you're a fucking choir bear compared to me a choir boy <laughs> wow it's <laughs> good stuff oh we there we go uh and this film cost a hundred million dollars to make yeah it didn't make that money back oh dear uh, but I really like it. It's got a fucking stupid metal soundtrack. Corn, Limp Biscuit, Guns N' Roses, The Prodigy, Rob Zombie, Eminem, Power Man 5000. Like, it's basically my teen. Yeah, hood. it's your teen dream. Uh, that is, is, and it's just, you would never, they would never make a film as risky as this anymore. I mean, I guess for good reason, considering it flopped. But like, I remember it, it was very much a kind of like hard R-rated 18 certificate. Yeah. Like you say, hundred million dollar blockbuster with Arnold Schwarzenegger, amazing, really. Well, at the same amazing. time, they were sort of making the Devil's Advocate with yeah. Pacino, and, yeah, um, and Keanu Reeves, which we're not covering. Sorry, everyone's had a go at playing the devil around this time, right? Yeah, from was, from, from this... De Niro and Angel Heart onwards. We've yeah, I don't everyone... know, but this weird late nineties like resurgence of yeah big budget devil movies. Yeah, love it, love very it. Very interesting. It is very interesting. Uh, okay, so there you go. So that's End of Days, mm. uh, a classic. Check that one out if it sounds appealing to you. Uh, okay, what's next on the list? We are now coming to the section of the pod that we seem to care every single time you and I come together. It is a section called We Wish We Had a Woman Here. <laughs> uh, it's 2008, <laughs> Jennifer's Body. You and me are going out tonight. Wear something cute, okay? You always do what Jennifer tells you to do. It's just that I like the same things that she likes. Hey, Jennifer. 
You look really pretty. Why don't you just come by my place? Well, this is random. This isn't really your house, is it? We can play mommy and daddy. No way. <laughs> Uh, this film's really got its fans as well, hasn't it? I yeah. think it, it was a bit of a flop upon initial release, but it's kind of been reclaimed a little bit, I think. In right, so, because this film's fucking cool, man. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is Diablo Cody, right? After, Written by. Yeah, after... Uh, after and, and, oh, it's Karen Kusama. Yeah, of um, The Invitation and uh, Destroyer. Mm, mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. It's great. And Megan Fox, Amanda Seyfried and Adam Brody. Yep. And also uh, Chris Pratt's in it. Um, oh yes he is yeah 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 in Devil's Kettle Minnesota Needy Kesnicki is a shy teenager uh, student that idolizes her cheerleader friend Jennifer Check. so they go to see this band called Low Shoulder at a bar and they've got that like isn't that like that that Through the Trees song isn't that (laughs) I can't remember the song do you remember it's like well I just it's a brilliant it's a brilliant like kind of spoof or Mid- parody middle of middle of the road yeah indie rock music band. yeah it's great it's really um, funny but they they overhear that Jennifer is a virgin mm-hmm. so they perform a satanic ritual on her that backfires because mm-hmm. she ain't a virgin yeah nothing wrong with that uh, and she becomes effectively a succubi yeah and she fucking devours the dickhead men that exhibit exist in her world and this film is like so fucking ahead of its time yeah it is but it isn't like it, it comes out at the right time, but I don't think the world was ready no, for it. Definitely not. Definitely like it's a not. really clever, interesting look at sort of female body autonomy. Once again, I don't, I don't mind fucking talking about this. It's not for my place to say as <laughs> a boring straight white man, but um, I think it's really interesting. And it's looking at sort of female lust and thirst, which BFI doing a season. Certainly, the moment certainly are. are. Um, and sort of the ownership of that in a really interesting way. And she gets to fuck up a load of horrible dickhead dudes. Yeah. What, what isn't there to like? And there's some really gross, nasty bits in it as well. Mm. There's a lot of like kind of grisly body horror. There's a lot of like vomiting up black goop and, uh, and that kind of thing. It's really fun. It's really fun. Megan Fox is great. Uh, everyone in it is well, great, she, well, she, she fell foul to the fucking studios, didn't she? Yeah, she did. She didn't do what she was expected of her. And, you know, exactly. She needs a, a, a 2020 comeback, man. She does. Megan Fox is cool. She is really she cool. She still does the, tur- the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies. But does she? Yeah, she did a lot of Michael Bay stuff, didn't she? Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, The and, and actually Adam Brody's really funny and kind of subverting his sort of good you know wholesome good boy kind of image yeah as it's well. like when james vanderbeek was in rules of attraction yeah yeah and yeah turned into a piece of shit like yeah i always love it when like someone just goes completely against type yeah it's like, great or george clooney and um from dust of dawn yeah exactly do you ever watch that for the first time being like the man from er is saying fuck a lot <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> there was a lot of surprises in that film the <laughs> yeah. first time you watch it yes. yeah uh yeah no it's great i love jennifer's body it's really held up well and actually I- i'll plug i'll plug a uh, friend of the pod mary wilde her own podcast projections podcast she's just covered this in depth and i was a guest on there to talk about it with her and uh, so if you want to hear that that film covered in more depth by people probably more adept. Uh, adept at talking about it than we are you can listen to mary and sarah discuss that over on their podcast guess my invite must have got lost in the post <laughs> cheers mary and sarah uh, so there you go so that is karen kusama's jennifer's body uh, it's a good one all right moving on then what's next uh we're going to talk about a film that people have been bugging us bugging us bugging us to talk about yeah to give another chance, to give a fair shot in the arm to. <sighs> it's Rob Zombies, the Lords of Salem. I just saw the tenant like 10 minutes ago standing in the doorway. Oh, I hate to break it to you, but there is no person in number five. You have to understand that there is a war waging in heaven. On the rare occasion, a special child appears. Is everything all right? No. The curse of the Lords of Salem. 
possessing the souls of the Salem women, which the devil's child would inherit the earth. Satan, Satan come, come to us! us. Rob Zombie, it, it will be forever covered on these also, also rounds. rounds. We're, like, we're the only people that talk about Rob well, Zombie on this podcast. <laughs> we even did the fucking Free From Hell on, yeah, we on did. Patreon. We did. Can't get, I can't get away from this motherfucker. <laughs> I'm sick of him. So, yeah, you can hear us talk about House of a Thousand Corpses and The Devil's Rejects and Three From Hell. We did most of them on our Hicksploitation episode, Three From yeah. Hell on Patreon. Uh I've covered uh, the Halloween remake in various different yeah, episodes and different that. discussions. But yeah, let's. this is a slightly different type of movie for Rob Zombie, slightly, mm-hmm. uh, in that it's not Sid Haig um, fucking people up <laughs> dressed as a clown. But, you know, other than that. Yeah, but it's also shot quite conventionally, which yeah. is uh, a refreshing departure from, yeah. hello, I will overly stylize every, every single scene yeah. that I look to do. Now... Full disclosure, guys, neither of us got the chance, even though it is on Shudder and available to watch at any chance, to re-watch it since we both didn't like it in 2012. Now, I really, really wanted to give it a fair shot on the arm to uh, because there are a lot of people that really get behind Lords of Salem and say that it's a, a very interesting and, and different take and departure on what Zombie has done in pretty much the rest of his entire filmography. Yeah, 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 definitely, um, definitely. And I think that's true. And I, I remember thinking that even when watching it the first time, that it was very different to the rest of Rob Zombie stuff. Um, different doesn't always mean good, though, does Well, it? I still think, and I've said this time and time again, I still think Rob Zombie is just a bad filmmaker. I just think he's a bad director. So even though he's trying something a bit different and interesting here, he still didn't pull it off particularly well, in my opinion. However, like you said... Both of us haven't seen it since it first came out. I should give it another go at some point, and I and I will at some point in my life. Uh, so, but yeah, this one is um, it's it's more supernatural. It's more occulty. It's more witchy. Uh, I remember there being some spooky music. There's some sort of haunted record or yeah. vinyl or track, right? And yeah, and when they start, it's got to be like a bit music related. Otherwise, Rob Zombie yeah. will, be, will, will be ill. And it's exactly it just wouldn't <laughs> be him, would it? And it's it's set in a radio studio, a little bit Pontypool esque kind of like small radio studio yep. and uh, they play this record right and and sort of dodgy things start to happen from when they play this music yeah and i mean i'm just looking through the cast and it honestly mate like <laughs> what's usual it's what is the usual suspects <laughs> of ken foree d wallace <laughs> michael berryman sid hay barbara crampton yeah udo Kier, clint howard i mean he just yeah it's it's this, but the thing is so yeah I feel very terrible that I didn't I was going to watch it this morning but race with the devil won and I think you made the better choice I probably to be honest by the but I it. I do solemnly swear and if you follow me on Letterbox and this is a great fucking hook no one actually no one no one really going to give a shit no no I, I will know. watch Lords of Salem within the next amount of time let's say a month yeah from this coming out. Uh, and I, w- I really do want to give it a fair shot in the arm because I remember really not being taken with it and thinking it was fucking shit when I saw it. Yeah. So I'm, but I'm willing, much like uh, everyone talking about Scream Four, yeah. needing to have a a, a revisit because once again I thought that was trash. But everyone's saying give it another chance. Yeah, much no, like Je- right. much like Jennifer's Body, like a lot of people fucking hated that movie when it came out. And yeah. I mean, I didn't. It was always fucking cool, but yeah, no, I think it's true. I think it, give Lords of Salem another go. I, I'd like. I'd be intrigued to hear what you think of it a second time round, and I will try and rewatch it at some point as well. But we're, you know, um, you're busier than I am, mate. But it's, it, I am busy. Uh, but you know, um, I'm glad that a lot of people are sticking up for this film. And you know, write in, tell us what you like about it, because you know, maybe I'll try and give it a read on the podcast. At I some wouldn't point. mind some. I wouldn't mind some context. Yes, exactly. Uh, all right, okay. So that's Lords of Salem. If you're a Rob Zombie fan, give it a watch. Uh, okay, what's next? So um, I th- this is going to be kind of, a, I think, our, our wrap up one. I mean, we'll probably do a, a like a, a, a little catch all at the end. Yes. Uh, but I, I'm guessing the one we should probably bow out on is uh, the Black Coat's daughter. Yeah. Slash February. Yeah. I, what a stupid title! It's called February in the UK. I really like the Black Coat's daughter. Yeah, I don't know why they cooler. wouldn't just ca- ca- call it that here. But. Much cooler. Hey, Dad, just calling to see where you and Mom are, and if you're coming. Worst case, they come on Friday and everyone goes home and has a really nice break. After all, we can't let you live here. 
But you know about the sisters, don't you? They worship the devil. Is there something wrong? Why are you doing this? Do you believe in God, Joan? Ever tried to look for him? I look for him in the unlikely things that happen. Little coincidences. So it is. I rewatched it last night, um, and because the first time I saw it, I was very drunk. So I thought, let's give it another watch, and uh, it's really interesting. So it is a very low key um, story uh, set in a girls' Catholic boarding school uh, on the dawn of the kind of winter break, and everyone, all of the students, go home apart from these two girls who are left, uh, Rose and Cat, I believe. And the story is kind of split into three timelines we get and it sets itself up at the beginning the first timeline is about rose the second one is about another character uh seemingly unrelated played by emma stone called joan uh who is on her way to the boarding school and she's hitchhiking a ride and then uh the third storyline kind of brings it all together and that's the timeline uh called cat and it's basically the story of these three girls and the way they intertwine and this potentially evil presence lurking in this boarding school and how it affects these three girls uh it's a really interesting it's a canadian film and it really feels like a canadian horror film it's got that very bleak (laughs) wintry atmosphere it feels a bit like pontypool or one of those types of films it's just a great little indie horror film um it's a slow burn though i did get about 50 minutes into it thinking okay when is when is something going to happen now? And then it, and then it, and then almost it almost ends. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But then it actually it pays off in a really nice way, I think, towards the end. So yeah. So yeah, this was directed by Oz Perkins, who I have a bit of a love hate relationship with. Uh huh. Um, I really like the Black Coat's Daughter, mm-hmm. which I think we'll just call it. We're not going to call it. Let's call it the Black Coat's Daughter. It's the Black Coat's Daughter. Yeah. Uh, it's available on Netflix at the moment. Um, he also did another film called I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House. Yes. Did not Neither like did that I. One. And actually, he he made that after the Black Coat's Daughter, but it came out in the UK at least before yeah. the Black Coat's Daughter. Uh, yeah. Which Although, initially put me off wanting to watch the Black Coat's I, Daughter. I mean, I gave, I gave it a three. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, I didn't hate it that much, mm-hmm. but I didn't, I, it didn't really stick with me. I said about this film when I watched it... Uh, the 2nd of May, 2017. Right, yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. Uh, the devil was in the details, a slow burner that's worth sticking with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and in a much more succinct way, that was what I was droning on about there. It is a slow burn that's worth sticking with because it really pays off at the end. And it has that really brooding, bleak kind of dread that slowly builds throughout. And and really good performances as well. I haven't got the cast to hand. You, but it's You the, said Emma Stone. It's, it's Emma Stone. It's, no, it's not. It's Emma Roberts. Sorry, Emma Roberts. Yeah, of course, Emma Stone. Yeah, no, of course, it's Emma Roberts. And uh, and the, uh, Shipka, Kean and Shipka, is it? The, the girl that plays Sabrina in the new Sabrina. I'm terrible Yeah, there's Lu- Lucy Boynton. Mm, yes. And Sh- Ke- uh, Kieran, Ke- Kieran Shipka. Yeah, Ke- Kieran Shipka. Yeah, exactly. And Lucy, Lucy Boynton from Bohemian Rhapsody, Sing Street. Exactly. Apostle. Exactly. She plays Rose. So yeah, it's a really, it's a good slow burn little thriller and it relies more on atmosphere than it does on action uh, and good performances. But, it, you know, it also reminds me of a film that's not out yet, but some people may have seen it called St. Maud. It has that kind of creepy low key with some creepy nuns and some creepy Catholic iconography lots of crucifixes and things mm. uh convents you know that kind of stuff i find all that quite inherently creepy i don't know what that says about me i grew up catholic so maybe that's what it is uh but yeah the the all of that sort of stuff i find really creepy in horror films yeah maybe that yeah so i i, I appreciate the iconography of it but it doesn't find me i don't find it discerning but yeah. maybe because i grew up uh as a uh, sex cultist <laughs> exactly. and oz perkins has actually got um a new film out in it's already been out in the U, uh, in in Germany and it's mm. already been out in the US and we don't have a release date for it mm. uh, called Gretel and Hansel. Oh, 
which I've heard really good stuff about. Heard really great things yeah. about. Um, but no clue as to when it's coming out in the UK. No. But you lucky motherfuckers in America, you've already seen it. The ones in Germany, we missed it when we went to Berlin. No, It was playing in Berlin the, year, the week before we I played. I know, it's so annoying. so annoying. So um, But I really want to see that because I am interested in what Oz Perkins does because I think he does, he's quite a unique auteurist with the way that he presents and the stylized Definitely. versions of his films. And actually, you know, I read a bit about Black Coat's Daughter and he, he apparently said that really initially he was setting out to make a movie about grief and then decided to frame it in a kind of horror genre movie. So, And I think you can definitely tell that. It, he came at it from that way round. It was more a film about loss and grief. So it has that kind of atmosphere, as opposed to he just set out to make a scary film about nuns or whatever. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely got that vibe to it. I loved it. It was really, really good. So, and that, that leads us to, to the end. Yeah, there you go. So I mean, there are, the, the problem, once again, when we do this episode, there are dozens and dozens hundreds. of films that we could have mentioned. You know, uh, The Devil's Candy, uh, Le Vide from 2009, the French horror film, which I think is Bustillo and... Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Bustillo and Maori, the guys that did uh, Inside and the Leatherface yeah. version. Um, I mean, actually, The Devil's Candy is great. I'll just quickly say, I mean, I haven't rewatched it for this, but loved it when I first yeah, saw it. Yeah, big fan of it. It's about metal in it, so I it like it. It is, and it's really scary as well. It's, it's really scary, scary, and it's nasty, and it's brutal. And I it's really like it. Embry, who I'm a massive fan of. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, ever since Cheap Thrills. Well, not, well, before Cheap Thrills. Oh, because it was the guy that did the love ones, isn't it? Yes, that's it. That's it. Fucking great also a great well. film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think we missed any. So that was like our preliminary list, but that, I mean, we we. I asked this question yesterday to everyone and said, what do you, the listeners, want covering? Yeah, exactly. So so just so we haven't missed anything out, I'll, I'll read what some of the people have responded to. Now, we may or may not have seen these films and we'll comment if we can. Uh, so Andrew Pope yes. of Whitlock and Pope fame uh, suggested uh, George Romero's Season of the Witch, a.k.a. Jack's Wife, Hungry Wives. Uh, which is available on Shudder. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. Uh, it's, it's a great film. I kind of wish I had covered it, actually. Um, we did, funnily enough, me, if you want to hear us talk about it at all, me and Giles Edwards talk about it on the Also Rand's folk horror episode. Again, there's a lot of crossover between occult and folk horror, so we do similar. cover it briefly there. Uh, but it's a great film. It's very unromero like in some ways, but it's very good. That's always a good... Uh, nice to have a little departure. Yeah. Uh, he also recommended The Neon Demon. Yeah. Which... Eh, Kind of a cozy. I guess it is. Sort of. God, I hate it. I fucking hate that <laughs> film. I'm a big Winding Refn fan, man. Me too. And I hated Neon Demon. I went to a preview of it at Picture House Central. Mm-hmm. And it was like late night. I was pumped. And I walked out the most, maybe the most despondent I've ever been. I hated it. It is one of the most pretentious wankeries like, it is it's it's wankery without even being in any way smart as or well it insightful was, it or was clever. the most obvious concept you could possibly make a wankathon about yeah. as well it, it was well, it's, it's what um starry eye it it, yes. it took what starry eyes did and made it worse yeah like starry eyes is a much more interesting so much better so yeah. much better yeah yeah 100% agreement there. Uh, actually, a lot of people also suggested covering that for the next series of the podcast because it's kind of a lot of body horror going on in that as yeah. well. But anyway, maybe it'll get a mention then. But anyway, yes, Neon Demon. Okay. All right. What else? What uh, I've got James Doherty saying Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, mm. which motherfucker, I fuck with that. Film. That's yeah, very you. Yeah, yeah. That and Bordello of Blood, like peak 90s trashy horror. I think Billy Zane's in Demon Knight. <laughs> uh, big fan. The Ninth Gate came up quite a bit. The Ninth Gate has come up a lot. I, uh, without going, I, I don't want to go down this wormhole, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to go out of my way to watch Roman Polanski's later work, to be honest. And I haven't. Oh, I've never seen the. I game. haven't seen it either. So Hand, I, hands up. I think it's because we were so woke, <laughs> but we woke up before. Ever, no, actually, no. Polanski's been a piece of shit for like, eight, like forever, for but decades. I think everyone, uh, everyone has their own rules uh, about whether or not they want to watch movies by people like him. I've chosen to not watch any films that he's made since being a, a rapist. The uh, thing is that that one. <laughs> I know, obviously, like the Johnny Depp thing is now up in the air in terms of. Yes. Yeah, like it's going to court and yeah, everything like that yeah. but you know back in 2017 when there was no proof and no evidence out 
it, that was like the most cancelled film of all time. It Johnny was. Depp in a Polanski movie yeah, was like exactly forget that's it double much. But anyway, I have actually heard really good things about the Ninth yeah, Gate. And good. the thing is, Polanski's a fucking good filmmaker. So there you go. Uh, okay. All right. What else? What else have we? A had lot of people saying 2008's Left Bank, which I have never fucking heard of. No, nope, me neither. But that came up quite a lot. Okay. Um, uh, give us a drop us a message. Tell us uh, tell us a bit about Left Bank if if you are a fan of it. Uh, over on the discussion group, we had. Uh, let's have a look. R- Rebecca McCallum has suggested The Witches, the Hammer film, The Witches, which is fucking great. Now I did actually briefly cover that uh, in our Hammer episode where we did The Devil Rides Out. Graham and I talked about it a little bit at the end of that episode. Episode. So if you want to hear us discuss that very briefly, you can. Um, but actually, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I would check out The Witches. It's excellent. Uh, James Bentley has said Harry Potter. You well, ha- I don't know if he was taking the piss there. <laughs> I, I, I was like, you know, like that Mad Max gif of that's bait. Yeah. yeah I was yeah. like, I'm not rising to it. <laughs> I'm not having it. If, that is, if he's serious, fuck off. <laughs> if he's not serious, that's very funny, mate. Uh, yeah, we're uh, Aaron Hoggy has said Manos, The Hand of Fate. Oh, yeah. That's like known as like one of the worst movies of all fucking time. Right. Um, I, when, he, when he mentioned it, I was, um, I was like, oh, maybe. But mm. time has been a, a factor. But Manos, Hand of Fate is like renowned. I think it's like up there with like Baby Geniuses 2. Right. On IMDb's like worst rated right. ever. Oh, right. Well, it sounds um, like something you should check out, Brad. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, everyone said, oh, do, a, do the worst for the inside <laughs> podcast. Yeah. yeah. We don't need any more Let's podcasts. make this happen. This is what I'm trying to make happen. Brad's podcast on the worst movies of all time. No one wants to listen to that. <laughs> Aaron Hoggy also suggested Laws of Salem, and he said Rob Zombie's tribute to older cult films. Not very good, though, he's put in brackets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that. Uh, Jim Armstrong said uh, Alicarda. A Mexican oh, film. Oh, I have from no fucking clue what that is. No. I read that and did the whole like, mm, don't know. Uh, Peter Marshall said, Long time dead. Not the best, but I remember going to see it at the cinema. The street lights flickered on the way home. Now, I remember mm. that. Yeah. That's from 2002. It's Brit produced. Oh, it sounds familiar. I'm doing this off the top of my head without any yeah. thing. And I seem to remember the front cover. I think there's like loads of like, uh, it's almost like an Ouija board, but not. It's like pieces of like paper with like tones that sounds and signs very and familiar and is then, it is it where they do a ouija board at the beginning i think so and then it isn't it kind of like lichen-esque i've like, seen this of course I've seen you have this. Yeah, yeah 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 like when you were a teenager yeah um i definitely remember it because when he mentioned it, i was like yeah this this motherfucking thing let me have a look at the per- yes 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 yes, 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 yes. Right? i was just about to say it's got a pair of eyes on it yeah and like there's all the signs and thingies yeah and it i, th- I thought it was british is it british it might be British. They look like English people. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure it's Brit produced. If I'm, if my, oh, the word gin in Arabic. So there's a gin in it. Interesting. And bits and pieces and a Ouija board. Uh, and yeah. it's directed by Marcus Adams, who did fuck all. Right. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I, did, I definitely remember maybe going to cinema and seeing it as well. I don't know how old that man is, but I definitely. Do you remember going to see that in the cinema? Yeah. And it, I don't think it was very good. No, 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 no it, definitely it, not. It, and I, I only remember the point, bit at the beginning when points, they do the Ouija board. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. And what happens from there, I have no clue. But points for obscure Brit horror reference there, mate. Well exactly. done. Exactly. Lovely. Uh, Michael Cool has said Evil Speak. I don't yeah. know what that is. That's with Clint Howard. Uh-huh. And it's about a demonic computer program. Uh-huh. And it's fucking cool. And my girlfriend got it for me on Blu-ray a couple of uh, years and years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it's fucking region locked and I can't watch it. Oh, no. Uh, but it's great. It's basically like this bully who kind of acts out fantasies on this computer system, mm-hmm. but then the computer system is in league with the devil and then he can do possess and you know, he himself gets possessed. And right, right, right. It's nice. super gory. I think it was on uh, part of the band Video Nasties. Excellent. Which you can listen to on the Evolution of Horror Patreon. There you go. Lovely plug. Uh, We didn't talk about it on on there, but... It, um, it's part of that whole scene. It's part of the 80s scene. Um, here's an interesting one. And a couple of people I've I've seen bring this up on the discussion group. Uh, Steve Rutledge said, eyes wide shut. Stanley Kubrick. That came up on my Twitter as mm. well. What do you think of that being an occult movie? I think there's parallels to cultism. Cult, exactly. Without the occult. Cultism. Yeah. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's occult. Yeah. I guess there's a lot... There, there is a hidden secret society of people that wear robes and masks. Masons. <laughs> and there is a lot of sex, which also comes into these movies quite a lot. So that, I suppose... Does that mean that it's, it, it, I would say they're cousins. 
and, and, and there is definitely something about that film that is quite unnerving. Because again, would you even call it a horror film? But there's definitely something about it that is quite creepy in a way. It, uh, I'm, due a, I'm due a rewatch. It's we just, very we just good. I had the poster put up in my room. Yeah. In my front room to match the Suspiria one on the other side. I like it. Uh, and But yeah, we're going to go and do a little Eyes Wide Shot rewatch. So maybe I'll report back and say, yeah, they're right. But I think it's more just kind of... Like it reminds me more of the skulls, yeah, yeah, like secret yeah. societies, yeah, and handshakes. Except instead of handshakes, it's with your penis and, and exactly. Vagina. It's a great film, I think. Oh, about, amazing! Uh, film. About a marriage, uh, ma- it's basically a great film about marital problems. But yeah. I don't know whether it's an occult horror. Movie. Eyes wide, cuck. Uh, but <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Thank you. But I really like it. I think it's a great film. I don't know why a lot of people really hated that film. I thought it was great. Uh, Nick Barrett has listed a bunch here. Race of the Race with the Devil, we've done. Tutu. A dark song next week. I married a witch. Don't know it. Uh, maybe he's just making a confessional. <laughs> just in the middle of his <laughs> suggestions. Uh, Messiah of Evil. Right, that was one that was on my um, potential list mm-hmm. and it got it got knocked it, off. It got knocked to the side, but it was one that I was looking at doing. Um, Black Death. That With sounds familiar. Sean Bean, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched yeah, that on Christmas yeah. Day that last year. That's quite recent, right? I, I 2009, like... Christopher Smith okay, yeah. directed it. Yeah, I watched it on Christmas Day, which was really, really weird. I was on Netflix at my parents' house and I said, what do you want to watch? And she was like, my mum was like, I'll oh, put that on for Ian because he he likes all that medieval stuff. And I was like, but it's not very Christmassy. <laughs> it's not massively Christmassy. But isn't by it the just about like the bubonic plague? Yeah, it's so it's se- literally about the Black Death. It's literally about Black Plague. I don't necessarily think it's very occulty. I think maybe there's some witchies in it. Mm. There is some witchies in it. There's some witch trial shit going on in it. Right. Nick Barrett <laughs> says, did you guys cover the ritual? Yes. Me and Stevie Webb covered the ritual in folk horror. Again, there's a nice little crossover there. So uh, that's... Just goes to show that people don't listen to all your episodes, mate. Now. Now I know. Well, there's so fucking many of them. I don't blame them. Uh, actually, Vincent Gain has now re- has responded and said, the ritual was covered in folk horror. So there you go. There Thank you, you go. Vincent. Uh, doing my job for me. Stephen McDade says, Psychomania. Now that got quite a little, uh, quite a few likes and I had a little mm. look at it because I, candidly, didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. But then when I saw it, I was like, ah, oh, that kind of looks familiar. And it looks like a kind of, I think it's also known as the Death Wheelers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of reminded me of Race of the Devil. Right, like, in, one in of the those. way that it looked. A gang of young people call themselves the Living Dead. They terrorize a the population of their small town after an agreement with the devil. If they kill themselves, firmly believing that it will lead to eternal life. Following their leader, they commit suicide, uh, but things don't turn out the way that they expected. It sounds really fucking interesting. Um, yeah, it in, does sound interesting. The film was universally blasted by critics upon release. One reviewer for the London Times wrote that the film was only fit to be shown at an SS reunion party. Okay. Did you, did you just out yourself as a Nazi? There? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now uh, I definitely do want to watch. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, Stephen Dovid has said, are any of the Witchboard movies worth covering? Uh, once again, this is... So I initially thought he meant Witchcraft, uh, which is the... Um, the most sequeled films of all time mm-hmm. because like they're nearly tied with Land Before Time but <laughs> um, which board let's have a look uh, yeah nah no, 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 <laughs> yeah. okay yeah nah I don't, I've never even heard of them mate if um, let's have a look what else have we got here Carl Andrews Norroy the Curse so I was a bit I, I, I fucking love that movie I've not seen that movie are you joking it's on Shudder it's a, but it's like a Japanese found footage Oh yeah, maybe I have seen it. But yeah. it's like ghosty. Yeah, it's like J horror ghosty, right? Yeah. yeah. So when he, I get why he's saying it's a cult mm. because, and if anything, I should have covered it in Ghost Also Rounds. Yeah. I think it was one of those ones I had buyer's remorse one when I when I did it. Mm-hmm. Um. So he is right in a way because it has got a cult tones to it, but it's mainly a a, a ghost story, a procedural like like The Ring. Yeah. In terms of like investigating yeah 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 uh, the death and the the occult is more of a framework within it it's a fucking cool movie and i'm really glad we finally managed to mention it yes like i adore the movie i was planning a trip to japan and i haven't been uh and i think it's that film's fault there you go, <laughs> there you go. i'm too scared to get cursed i love it uh peter jetnikoff has said satanic from 2016 yeah so this one came up a little bit as well and it looks to me i don't know if i've seen it uh, no, I haven't. I think, but Peter's it looks this. just like your direct to DVD fucking bullshit. As the three pound, <laughs> I'm not Peter. I'm not 
throwing you under the bus here, mate. I'm just saying what it looks like. Like, look at that, that and be like, that's a three pounder at Asda. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. cover wise, but, but that's... May- maybe it's better than the cover suggests. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but once again, I don't, even though it's a contemporary film and normally I'm very good at doing those. Uh, I don't think I've seen it. Maybe it never got a, a release here or something. I'll but... tell you what, it's consensus is not good. <laughs> no, okay, that's interesting. All right, well, that's a, that's another that's another recommendation there from Peter. Vincent Gaynor suggested Ready or Not. What do you think of that? I saw that yet last night and I was like, he's got a point. Yeah, no, I guess that's true. I mean, they're summoning a demon, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's good, good, good and suggestion. It's a, and Vincent. it's a cool film. It's a very good film. Uh, what else have we got? Others, most of the rest we've talked about. The Prophecy, The Dunwich Horror, Deathgasm. Interesting. Yeah. Deathgasm. But he's cancelled now, so we can't talk about it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Satan's Slave, 1976. Uh, That's from Joel Jones. I think I've seen that. Uh, but there's another one called like very similar name that's new yes 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 which uh, is um isn't that a remake of and it? is it's like iranian or something i think film? it's indonesian indonesian and i've heard it's really fucking good and scary i've, I've seen, seen it. that version yes the i think that's called satan slaves slaves plural yes i have seen that gave it three and a half stars and right said uh, I've got to be honest, I'm not overly familiar with Indonesian horror. <laughs> um, uh, he's talking about Norman J. Warren's Satan Slave. Yes. A young girl was caught up in, in a devil cult run by her evil uncle and cousin. Uh, here we go. Here's one. Here's one you'll be happy about. Joel Jones has suggested Demons from 1985. Oh. Yeah. In fact, we probably should have talked about Demons, shouldn't we? But it didn't cross my mind. didn't cross my mind at all, really. Because I would... I, I, where, I mean, the thing is, Demons is an interesting one because it's kind of got zombie ish yeah it, if, if anything i'd have put it because if i was going to put evil dead in zombies i'd probably put demons in zombies yeah. in a way yeah uh but i mean i'm happy to talk to you about de- <laughs> <laughs> i'm happy to talk to you about demons man well demons, it's a great film demons is fucking cool and say setting it in a cinema yeah it makes it even fucking cooler it's yeah the boy lambato barber like, yeah it's great it's like peak 80s italian ludicrousy yeah but and then the sequel's cool as well, Demons 2, where it's in the flat block and everything. Yeah. Not as cool. No. Not as cool, but... But they're great. They're great films. The Is it the first one that ends with them riding around on a motorbike around the cinema? Yeah, just... slicing up the demons Yeah, just slicing stuff. them all up. It's yeah. great. It's really amazing. Fun. They're going to like see this horror film and whatever. I fucking love that movie. There you go. A lot. Uh, so, so many suggestions. I haven't got time to read them all, but those are most of the ones that we haven't yet mentioned. There you go. Um... I love it. Uh, a huge amount that we've just covered there. If you were to recommend just one from the list, what would be the, oh, your me. what would be your top recommendation? I you were talking to everyone. Yeah. Then. <laughs> uh, me. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to pick one that I picked because yeah, of course. Um, I'm arrogant. Uh, if I had to pick one from my occult also rounds, I would choose. Wishmaster, of course, <laughs> of course, yeah. Wishmaster ticks the brand boxes there. It's everything it. I want from a film <laughs> and more. That's uh, a good. I would, I would say, if you haven't seen the Black Coat's Daughter, check it out because it's quite an interesting. But but it's but it's quite low key. If you want something a bit schlockier, I would also recommend the Sentinel because it's ridiculous and fun. So there you go. We like ridiculous. Uh, love it. Well, we we did we rattled through a lot there. We did well yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in an hour and a half. Not bad going. Jesus Christ. Uh, Brad, thank you very much. Where can people find you and more of your work out there on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Hadbranson, Instagram at Hadbranson, and Letterbox at Splatter Patter. Brad, thank you very much. Cheers, mate. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my co-host, the brilliant Brad Hansen. Now, don't forget, if you want to be reminded of all of those films that we just hit you with, uh, you can check out Brad's Letterboxd account in which he has listed all of the films uh, discussed in this week's episode. So head on over to letterboxd.com and follow Brad. He's at Splatter Patter and you'll get to see the full list of films discussed on this week's show. 
So, what do you think of this week's episode? And what do you think of our list of occult recommendations there? Do you have any extras that you want to add to that list? I'd love to hear more of your recommendations. Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. If you want to hear more of me and Brad talking crap, uh, then you can uh, head on over to Patreon this week as me and him just got back from the Berlin Film Festival and we were discussing some of our favourite movies as well as some of our favourite nights out from that festival. Uh, Just head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror and for the very reasonable price of $5 per month you will get access to weekly bonus episodes much like that one as well as a whole back catalogue of other content. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Acast, Libsyn and Spotify. Please do subscribe to us. Please do tell your friends and family about us. Tweet about us. Post about us. Shout to the world about us. I'd really appreciate that. And if you can't afford to support this podcast financially on Patreon but you still want to lend us your support, I'd really appreciate a little review on Apple Podcasts. Preferably a nice five star one. That really helps the podcast get discovered by new listeners. Okay, well, here we are then. We're at the end of the series. We've covered a hell of a lot of occult movies, and there is but one, one incredible occult horror masterpiece from this last decade that we have yet to discuss, and it is an incredible one. Next week, for our final review of the series, we are going to be discussing Liam Gavin's A Dark Song from 2016. Now, as well as discussing the movie with friend of the pod Mike Lee Graham, I am also going to be joined by the writer and the director of A Dark Song, Liam Gavin. Liam did an incredible job with A Dark Song, and he's also going to be directing the next series of The Haunting of Hill House, so we had plenty to talk about. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.